we are trustworthy and we do like to create win-win scenarios and not let people down. Episode 177. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Ben Richards, who is the director and founder of Aura Architecture and Interiors. He's the director and co-founder of XP Property, and he is one of the founders of XP Surveys. So in this conversation, Ben and I discuss his entrepreneurial background. I discovered in this uh, interview as well that Ben was also once a poker player and we talk a lot about how some of the strategic elements of poker, how the management of luck and the management of skill have been a great asset in creating businesses, the psychology that's involved in poker and reading people, how that has had an impact on being able to market and negotiate. Um, We talk about how Ben has started up Aura and built it into a semi-automated professional services firm, which has then become essentially a cash flowing asset, which has allowed him to invest those surplus funds into the development company XB Property, so his property investment company. Also, we start to see a really fascinating relationship as Ben's expertise and experience grows in the development company, how that starts to feed back into Aura, the architectural services company, and allows him to create a much more refined and nuanced and compelling offer for developer clients that he's servicing in the architecture business. And XP Surveys is another part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem that he is creating here. So a brilliant entrepreneur, fantastic designer, Um, and a really, really interesting podcast. And I think quite a good blueprint here for anybody who's interested in, 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 in development and investment and how an architecture business can be used to serve that. And just, just listening to some of the strategies that Ben has implemented here, there's absolute gold. So sit back, relax and enjoy Ben Richards. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Ben, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, really good. Yeah, very hot and sticky. It is. But, um, it is. Forward to this conversation. It's very warm, isn't it? So you are the founder of Aurora Architecture and also one of the co-founders of XP Property. Um, you've been specialising in interiors, residential work, um, and I really am enjoying this kind of. The, the relationship between an architecture practice or an architectural design company and that of a property development company. And this is often a dream of many architecture business owners is to be able to be involved in both. So my first question will be, how did Aura start? Uh, so Aura started in 2014, actually, um, when I was in full-time work. Um, I kind of set it up. I've always wanted to run my own business. Mm-hmm. I've always wanted to set up an architectural practice. And I kind of set it up really to help some friends and family with some planning applications to cut my teeth on business, understand how accounting works, taxes, setting up limited companies, all that sort of stuff. So I had it in the background running for three years before taking the plunge in May 2017 yeah. um, to go full on into, right, this is what I want to do. I want to grow an architectural practice. I want to grow a business, um, leave corporate life behind me. I was working for the Berkeley Group at the time. Um, and and that was it. May 2017, jumped headfirst into business ownership. Brilliant. And so when you were at Berkeley Group, you were working as a technologist or an engineer on that kind of architecture? Yeah, te- so I was te- a technical manager. So I joined on their technical academy, went through to sort of technical coordinator and technical manager um, in sort of two and a half, three years. Worked on some incredible projects. I, I only worked on two. Um, right. They were both on Nine Elms in Battersea. Oh, right, very nice. One being... Yeah, 816 units, and then the other one was 955 units. Um, big infrastructure projects, you know, six to eight year programs, completely 
different side of the fence from what I was doing before that, which was very much a small architectural practice, you know, for um, four years working for um, basically two structural engineers that, that sort of ventured into architectural design, house extensions, refurbishments, small new builds, small property developments. Um, so I went from that side of the table over to the, the mammoth that is the Berkeley group, um, the, the dark side of the property developer in the house. <laughs> Um, but absolutely loved it. I think, um, the scale of things, the, the business, the people, the drive, the high performance, the high pressure, the, the scale of the projects were, were just phenomenal. Um, and it was a great experience. Fantastic. It's quite clear from looking at the website of Aura that you know what you're doing in terms of marketing and, um, and that there's, there is a client focused you know, way that you've set out your, your copy and information. And was this, was this something that was, how did you figure that out? How did, how did that come about? Cause it's not the regular kind of website we see from, no. from, from architects. Um, and it's, and it's not, no, it, it is, it is purposeful. And, um, you know, I, I didn't want to be an architectural practice where it was really just you know pretty pictures and and not really a lot of some substance behind it mm -hmm. um, and from, from day one marketing was a, a really key driver of what i wanted to do because my idea and my my um goals for aura really weren't um me working in the business i, I always wanted to build the company as a business that could work without me um, and marketing is obviously part of part of doing that. Mm -hmm. So trust is another part of our sort of core values and really kind of who I am, like trust and kind of respect, understanding people. Um, that's really kind of who I am as a character and what I wanted to bring into to Aura. And to, to build that trust and respect, I feel like you need to give information. Um, so really, I kind of built the website. I built kind of our marketing platform on on really kind of content marketing um and the, the very early days i wrote a lot of blogs myself i kind of created all of that infrastructure that is now there doing a lot of stuff for me now that i created four years ago like my um how much is my house extension going to cost blog gets about 20 to 25 percent of our track our, our google um views every month and i wrote that for four years ago and it continues to kind of generate leads generate attention um and improve our sort of quality of website so yeah i i built the the website definitely from a client focus perspective what questions are they going to be asking mm. what are the pain points for them how can we react to that but we've also got some pretty pictures on there as well you know it's, it's not all kind of just boring information it's actually you know we do create some fantastic homes and um, we create some really good um, portfolio projects and some amazing photos and videos um, but we've also got some substance behind it as well I think yeah no it, I mean it's it's a really nice balance between your the eye candy the visual vitamins that we all expect and know from architectural websites but it's leading with a very strong client first narrative um, and information is presented in a, in a very legible manner and it's kind of like you know I, for me when i see this i'm like oh okay great you know often spend a lot of time reviewing and looking at architects websites and there's a, you know there's a big spectrum some some are brilliant and some are not so brilliant and there are lots of um pitfalls that architects will fall into and i like what you've just said as well about you know you set this up as a business that you wanted to essentially have automated or you didn't mm -hmm. you didn't envision yourself being the the the, the multi-hatted a multi-armed you know person who's doing absolutely everything and was was that like that's quite uh again in 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 the world of architecture if you like that's quite a leap in terms of thinking um to be thinking like an entrepreneur or to be thinking like a business person where did that where did that yeah. come from was that something that you picked up from berkeley or was that something always I think that's something I've always wanted to do. Like I've known that I would always run my own business. I think from a, a very young age, that has been part of what I've wanted to do. I, I am entrepreneurial. If we, we sort of we might delve into some of my background, but um, you know, it's it's very very different to most. You know, my my degree was actually in architectural engineering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I studied four years in Cardiff for that because, um, to be honest, the kind of the straight architecture route kind of really put me off in terms of 
um, I guess how design focused and arty it was. Um, I'm very technical. My my you know I have um, A levels in maths, further maths, physics. You know, graphic design and product design are kind of part of that process because I like being creative. Mm -hmm. But I'm very technically minded. I like maths. I like engineering. I like solving problems. Yeah. So actually, the architectural engineering course I felt was absolutely perfect for me. It still gave me that freedom to be creative and design focused. But actually, you know, from a building perspective. I can des design the steel work. I can design the masonry, the, the, the timber um, joist. The like, I, I can design all that if I brought my books back out. Yeah. Um, I don't do that anymore, but I can. Um, so understanding how things are put together, I think, is fundamentally kind of what I like. Um, and the, the, the combination of that architecture and engineering was, was always kind of um, a real massive bonus for me. That doesn't really talk towards the entrepreneurial and kind of business owner side of stuff, but... Um, I've always liked finance. I've always liked business. I've always liked building things. And my journey in the last five years, the thing I have enjoyed the most is business. Mm. And, and it, it fundamentally does come down to the growth of something and building something, whether it's building houses or building businesses, seeing something start at nothing and, and something being created out of that that I've kind of taken along for the journey is really what I get enjoyment out of. Yeah. Um, so yeah, business and, and entrepreneurship is something that I've I've really become a keen. Um, uh, you know, I've educated myself on that topic. Well, it's, it's again, it's again really interesting what you're saying about how the 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 slight sort of nuanced degree that you pathway that you took in terms of being more architectural engineering versus the classic architecture, which is you know in the UK particularly is much more design led and arts based and you can get off into all sorts of wonderful worlds of strange mm -hmm. imagination and there's a big conversation at the moment of like lots of architects are coming out graduated and feeling woefully unprepared for practice because they don't know mm -hmm. how things are put together they don't know how things yeah. they don't know and they wouldn't be able to, to specify their own steel columns and then they jump mm -hmm. into running their own business and they they're missing those key skills the 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 kind of being a part one or a part two who is you know woefully low paid and in part because well <clears throat> there's not a lot of practical knowledge that you have for a business and it's probably going to take a business about two years to train you up before you do have all that information um and so seeing your your degree path then you're kind of setting up your own architecture um business you've got a lot of those competencies already in-house ready to go and there's an entrepreneurial flair behind it, which is kind of a recipe for good things to happen. Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the bit that I missed out is that I, I, you know, graduated from university and then played poker for a living. Oh, which, um, better. Is, um, <laughs> so you've got an app for risk as well. <laughs> slight detour. Yeah. I mean, the risk side of it obviously comes through to the property development business. But um, yeah, you know, for, for me, I think doing things slightly differently, I'm, I've always kind of trusted my instincts and and you know the direction that i want to travel and um i'm generally quite determined to go out and get that yeah. and and use the resources i have to to move to the next level and, and what's the next thing and and try to sort of overcome and solve problems so yeah i, th I think business and entrepreneurship um i am a student of it absolutely mm -hmm. i've really loved it um i think when i set out on the journey i was kind of now, I was enjoying the, the property, the design, the architectural, the construction side of it, but I've definitely transitioned now more into business. You know, what's the P&L looking like? You know, um, what's the marketing funnels um, that we've got in place and how are we driving more leads? What's our conversion rate? Yeah. Um, you know, we've spoken about or we've spoken a little bit about XP property, but 18 months ago, we set up a topographical survey, a measured survey business. Um, and that is something that I'm now really enjoying because it's a fresh startup business that, um, you know, we're, I feel like I'm, I'm using a lot of the things I learned growing Aura mm. to then plow into XP surveys to get it hopefully within three years to the point in which I've taken Aura in five years, if that makes sense. So yeah, always learning, love the business side of things, still love property, still love designing. Um, but I've, I have managed to step away from that within the architectural practice. Love it. Um, so before we talk a little bit more about Aura and XP surveys and XP property, you mentioned there some of you, your, your entrepreneurial background. So was Aura not your first business? Uh, Aura was my first business. Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, it's, I say that 
cheekily because actually I kind of see poker as my first business. <laughs> like I, I graduated from uni even before graduating, yeah. I was playing university and I was using it to you know fund beer beer runs and um, enjoy university, not like a student. Um, but I, I kind of. I did see poker as a business, you know, when I said to people that that's what I was doing for a living, they, they often laughed and said, oh, you're a gambler. And I'm like, I, I, I don't really see myself as a gambler. I don't walk into a casino and hit the blackjack table or hit the roulette table. Mm -hmm. Those games have no interest to me because you are mathematically destined to lose yeah. over the long run. Whereas with poker, you're playing other people. Other people have weaknesses. If you've got an edge on that, on, on those, um, those people on that table, in the long term, as a skilled poker player, you will win in the long run. Um, yes, there's luck involved. And of course, you will become unlucky in certain um, circumstances because there's probabilities involved. But actually, if you are a good poker player, you will win money in the long run. Um, and I almost saw it as a, um, you know, my chips were my resources. They were they were my, my things to use to, to grow and push for more and, you know, utilizing those chips were my my weapons mm -hmm. basically um the goal was to get as many of them as possible how i got that was basically with individual little problems to solve the ability to read people the ability to assess risk the ability to understand strategy mathematics and i think that all gets lost because people see casino royale james bond you know making outrageous bluffs and um you know that isn't poker <laughs> it's really sad that it's not that because it's quite exciting yeah um but actually poker is is mathematics it's probability it's um you know putting pressure on people it's having a strategy um and uh yeah i kind of saw that process of my life as my first sort of mini business I may all be fully relying on me. Absolutely, that's, that's absolutely fascinating, and it's interesting actually. I've come across a number of professional poker players in the past. Uh, we've got have a family friend of ours, a guy called Nicky Pasord, who who um, is on, is on the on the circuit quite a lot. And it was the first okay. time I came across was like, oh, actually, you can make a, a fully legit career out of doing this full time. Um, you can, yeah. I, um, I mean, for me, it. It, it was one of the kind of better performing years financially I've ever had. It was, you know, there's no tax involved. So in reality, I jumped out of a, you know, a, a graduate um, degree thinking most of my peers were probably on 23, 24 grand as a graduate engineer. Mm -hmm. Realistically, I was on about 70 grand yeah. because the money I was taking out was, was net, you know, was, was zero tax. Um, so if I were to kind of scale that up, it, it literally was around 70 grand, which was crazy. Um, so, and so is it is it net tax because it's basically classified as as winnings, winnings of a game. It's gambling winnings. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no there's no tax on it. You know, you can choose to pay uh, your national insurance and other things like that. But, it, but from an income tax perspective, obviously you're still paying VAT, you're still paying council tax, still paying all the other taxes that they try and get you with. Yeah. Um, but in, income tax being obviously the big one, um, you know, there was no income tax on it. So um, yeah, from a financial perspective, is great. From a personality and a person perspective it just wasn't the life that i wanted to lead you know i was working yep in inverted commas three to four days a week starting at six in the evening sometimes so, not finishing until right, right. seven in the morning right on, on a good day um it allowed me to go on holidays have the freedom but actually i love people yeah you know i, I like working with people i like being face to face i like talking to people mm -hmm. um, and like i said before productivity and creating things is, is what I really am passionate about. And I think the poker just didn't give me that. It didn't tick that box. Um, so here I am, I guess. Brilliant. That was fast, absolutely fascinating. Well, and, and I love all the different kind of skills that you were saying that you developed as a poker player as well. So kind of thinking mathematically, thinking strategically, being able to plot and um, map out luck over long periods of time, which actually requires a lot of forward thinking and a lot of skill. Um, and also the ability to be able to read people and the psychology behind things, which I would I would expect that that's kind of been quite useful in in deal making and negotiations and just the ability to be able to sell, even the ability to be able to market. There is that a strong absolutely strong... Yeah. Un understanding your position and understanding you know, your opponent or you know the person you're talking to position. Yeah, you know to find a win win scenario. Um, that is fundamental to certainly my property development mm -hmm. um, um, and also in business, you know, you, you're always selling. 
um, you have to, you know, to, to, to keep your business going, you have to make sales. And I think from a UK, you know, person growing up in the UK, selling actually for most people is quite difficult. Yeah. I still, still struggle with, with, with it sometimes. Um, I do actually probably prefer the marketing side of it than necessarily the sales side of it, but, um, they're both skills that I absolutely love learning about. Yeah. Fascinating. So you started Aura, um, you very kind of keen to have it as an automated business where you weren't kind of doing every last role. How did you start building that out then? What were some of the strategies that you put in place to ensure that you weren't, you didn't become the bottleneck in the business, which is, you know, and the source of all overwhelm? Yes. Um, I mean, that still happens sometimes, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I started, um, started in May and again, taking a slight detour and doing things slightly differently. Um, I employed a business assistant first, first hire within you know a month. Um, a couple months after that, I employed a part two architect to work with me. Um, and then I went traveling for five months, <laughs> so, um, which, which, yeah, you know, I started in May, went traveling in October, um, and got the two people in house to really help manage the day to day. You know, I was overseas still doing Skype calls with some clients mm -hmm. with, you know, Skype calls with the, with the team, you know, using my tablet to mark up drawings and comment and go back and forth. Um, so again, not, not the most common route, but actually I managed to keep things ticking along with the projects that we had on site or, or had on the drawing board. Um, but it also freed me up somewhat to focus on the things that I did want to do longer term. I wasn't being pestered by the team like you are when you go to the office. You know, it's, they, they don't have a solution, so they come to you. What do I do here? If they're left to their own devices, actually, they probably will figure it out. <laughs> But because you're there, you do get pestered. Because I was over in on the other side of the world, they couldn't do that. So one, it freed up my time to think about, okay, what, what are the marketing avenues I want to do? The blogs that I mentioned earlier, you know, I'll write a couple of blogs. I'll figure out how I want my website to, to, to look mm. and, and the direction of that. The sales funnels that I want to introduce, downloadable PDF guides that are evergreen and will just stay there for people to download. I can capture emails. I can start creating email databases. Um, all of that good stuff that I just basically just plunged into my ear on, you know, audible and podcasts and, you know, marketing books and all that sort of stuff, just really trying to, I guess, improve my awareness of how sales and marketing works yeah. and business, you know, as a whole. And, but, but all of those things that I mentioned, you know, downloadable guides, creating blogs that work from a, you know, drive some SEO traffic, um, you know, the presentation of the website, the types of stuff that I want to give out to to um to potential clients mm -hmm. or show potential clients um yeah i mean you know put a structure behind okay how do, do the next couple of years look what team do i need in place because you can't build a profitable business without a team you know fundamental everything that i do is a is a we isn't us it, it isn't an i yeah uh, and you need you need that and you need um you know, different layers of management within the business so it did free up my time and allow me to think about some of those higher level things which when you're in the trenches dealing day to day with issues you don't spend the time doing unless you forcibly take yourself out of that situation yeah i, I like this idea of actually the fact that you weren't there in an office because this is a this is a real mindset shift for a lot of architects and a lot of business owners um you know, we're having these kinds of tensions at the moment with employees who do want to have remote working hours and mobile access and, you know, have a bit more freedom in their lifestyle and not have to be in an office. And for many business owners, this is very difficult to get to work. Um, yeah. And, you know, and again, I think there's all sorts of culture shifts that need to happen. But ultimately, from the leadership side, being able to trust your employees to get on and and to do the work. And also, I would imagine that you have pretty good structures for accountability or really what's being measured is not the hours that they spend at the desk, but rather the results that they're delivering. And that in itself is a is a culture shift for many people. How, how were you able to kind of manage that with the team or just make sure that they were, they were delivering the right results and they didn't kind of stray off into the wilderness of designing a balustrade for three weeks. And then, and then you're like, what on earth's this? <laughs> yeah. When you check their time, sheets and it's <laughs> you're like, double what you expected. Um, I mean, 
the, the the video calling side of stuff you know we're before before covid really was a thing we were already using skype and video calls right. to, to transfer information and communicate um i've always had tablet pcs i use Bluebeam software which i could not live without in terms of editing pdf sketching marking things up that was generally how i communicated because when i was overseas you know, I, I could be eight, 10 hours ahead of, of, of the UK. So maybe when Sophie was back doing a drawing, um, I look at it in the morning, but that's actually when she's finished work. So that was quite difficult and challenging in terms of like the time frame shift and, and making sure that we were on top of communicating with each other. So video video chats were definitely one way of keeping keeping tabs. And that's still the same now, given that I work from home three to four days a week, you know, with the team. Um, you know, other things that we use or use now is is zero we use zero accounting software you we use zero projects i mean we we do track um people's time on projects you know we have profitability targets to um keep people accountable i mean the biggest game changer for for me in the last nine months has been bringing on board a head of operations mm -hmm. i mean that that's really how i've managed to free up my myself from the business um and i would say at the moment probably 20 percent of my time is spent on aura um, and the rest of my time is spent between xp property and, and xp surveys um which is absolutely brilliant and kind of where i i really wanted it to get to um and a lot of that's been down to to bringing graham in to to manage that day to day um you know keep the team on track he's the one having weekly meetings with them you know in the first four years that would have been myself you know i would have been um having one-to-ones and catching up with the team regularly tracking progress on projects answering questions you know being at the you know firefighting at the front with with everyone coming to me like you say the bottleneck yeah. um you know not being able to respond to people whereas now with graham on board it's um yeah it is a different um process for me and i can focus on the higher level stuff that actually grows the business really interesting that you're there you know kind of very dialed into the metrics that you want to be observing in the business to make sure that a stuff is getting done but also there being their tools for you to be able to hold the team members accountable with and it's their goalposts and i think this this is mm -hmm. really interesting you know so many architects or practices or business owners it, you know the idea of being elsewhere or working remotely sounds great but then in reality it kind of goes wrong because there aren't those kpis and there aren't the goalposts in place in the first in the first circumstance which means that you have you have like people just drifting and not knowing necessarily what the rules of the game are so they're going to be spending however long they need to spend on something um which then loses your profitability and then if you're not keeping track of profitability you'll never know anyway just, you're just not not a sustainable <laughs> business at that point i think one of the biggest game changes i could recommend for you know whether it's architecture or any business is um you know having management accounts every mm -hmm. month you know it's it surprises me how many people don't have that that p l and um yeah profit and loss and kind of management account reporting to really show you how the business is performing you know they leave it almost to the end of the year when their accountant pulls together their final figures to figure out actually how much money they've made um and that for me is just bonkers um but we yeah we we do use zero uh, it's something that i've used for a long long time um it's yeah i i think the best software out there i've tried um, QuickBooks, and I've tried um, a few other platforms, but I keep coming back to zero. Right, brilliant. Um, so, when was it the right time then, or what was in place for you to feel confident enough to start XP Property? How did that come about? And was this, you know, obviously, when I talk to architects who want to become architect developers or they want to be involved in property investment or, or, or development, one of the biggest issues, number one, is capital. Right. So where, do they get, where are they going to get the money from? And the idea of using somebody else's money is so alien, so foreign, so frightening. So no way that can't happen. Um, but the other thing is actually having the, the, the sort of mental headspace to be able to, be, to go and think about property in a strategic manner um, because you're so entrenched as the bottleneck inside of a business. So when was it the right time for you to start XP Property and how did that transition happen and because it's it, it, yeah it's, so it's like a it's quite an amazing juggling act that you're doing where you're running three different businesses now 
Yeah, it's it's tough. <laughs> um, I've been banned by the wife from starting more businesses. <laughs> so it's reason enough. Um, yeah, it's probably worth winding back to to my time at the Berkeley Group. So my final six months with the Berkeley Group was actually spent in weekends and um, evenings project managing my first property development right. project. Um, so I actually bought an end terrace property um, with planning permission for a two-story side extension to convert a one-bed start home into three-bed family house, basically. Um, bought the property with that in mind, but knowing that that's a really poor use of mm -hmm. the space. Went back in for planning approval, um, got a two-bed end terrace new build um, approved on the garden plot next door. Um, basically built that out, you know, did the planning work, did the building regs packages, detailed design, um, coordinated with building control, got all the finance in place, which I'd never done before, sorted out warranties and, you know, basically everything from start to finish, two bed, um, start a home, new build, which for four months of my life, I would do of an evening and a weekday whilst working full time at the Berkeley group. And then on refinance of that new build property, I was basically, um, it was a very profitable deal. Mm -hmm. I managed to re refinance all of the costs, put about £40,000 into my back pocket whilst keeping the asset as a rental property. So that's a, a buy to let um, um, property that I've, I, I'm actually just trying to sell at, at the moment five yeah. years on. Um, um, but that forty grand really gave me the kind of confidence to jump ship and and have a safety net, I guess, to kind of fall mm -hmm. back on. Um, and I literally refinanced. I remember it. I re refinanced um, on March the first, twenty seventeen, and two days later went in and handed in my notice. Um, and that was a real big stepping stone. And my boss tried to persuade me to stay. And I was like, literally, I've written this letter. It's not going any other way than in your hands. Um, this is the new route I want to go down. I want to start my own business. I want to do my own property developments. Um, and really, I guess XP property was just a matter of time. It wasn't an, a, a sort of will it, won't it. Um, I started with the architectural practice because that is a cash flowing yeah. business that, um, like you say, isn't capitally, um, capital intensive. Um, so that was a, a service based business that I knew would kind of cash yeah. flow. Um, whereas the property development stuff is more of the lumpier, lumpier sums. And I guess, you know, we touched on it previously working with progressive property. Um, I jumped into progressive property as well as starting the architectural practice because I wanted to learn more about property, mm -hmm. how to find them, how to fund them, how to source them, how to, um, you know, obviously the design and the construction side of stuff is, is second nature yeah. to me. Um, and I knew going into that room that I'd probably know the most about that process, but there's a lot of estate agents in the room. There's a lot of investors, a lot of finance people, a lot of mortgage brokers that have a lot of skill sets that I mm. don't. It's also a massive community of property investors and property developers that I can tap into and yeah. learn from. Um, so that was really kind of the instigator i joined their 12-month vip program that's actually where i met my business partner jack jiggins um and that's where it all started from an xp property perspective we started stacking a few deals together looking at a few things going on some viewings together um and it kind of just snowballed from there to the point where we had a couple of offer offers accepted um we really enjoyed working with each other we felt like we kind of complemented each other's skill sets same goals and kind of drive we're both quite young um, and that's where XP property was formed really, um, sort of six months after meeting, um, the limited company, the, the, se the second business came through the door. Um, and here we are now, yeah, four years so later. It's so interesting that actually you'd, you'd started your adventure into property while still at the Berkeley group. Um, and then that's kind of evolved and then obviously got involved with pro progressive and in that community, mm -hmm. there's a lot of kind of very clear strategies for being able to, 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 you know, uh, well, well, actually what was the creative strategies? Yeah. yeah. And th that's part of what I loved about it because there were things they were doing that I just didn't mm. know about exchange with delayed completion. What's that lease options? No idea. Option agreements, no idea. So all of these things that we now have in our back pocket as a property developer mm -hmm. are all ways in which we can de-risk yeah. sites. We can add value to sites. We can do things sometimes on our own terms 
Um, we've just so we've exchanged on we exchanged on something today actually. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And we exchanged on something last week, um, which is also very exciting. Um, both of those we've de-risked with exchange with delayed completions or kind of conditional mm -hmm. purchases. So we've put a very, very nominal exchange deposit down. Um, we've got the time now to take it through the planning process, to prep our builders, to get everything in place so that as soon as we own the keys, the finance starts then, as opposed to buying an asset with development finance or bridging finance, which is extremely yep. expensive, um, and then holding the asset whilst you're just basically giving money to the yes. banks um which, we, which we've got on some of our sites you know reading borough council have uh delayed us by about 18 months on one of our projects and that's costing us three grand a month and that's money we just won't see yeah. back so um yeah all of those strategies processes parts of the property development life cycle is sort of what I started learning with mm. Progressive. So what were some of the creative strategies that you implemented with the property, with XP property, that were slightly different and slightly different from, say, you know, jumping straight in and getting a buy to let and kind of just scaling it that way? Were there, were there ways or services or deals that you were involved in that were cash flowing much more quickly than, than the traditional uh, accumulation of assets? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I guess the biggest one, which you kind of touched on earlier in terms of people's risk appetite, um, we have done most of our deals with very little of our, our right. own money. And, and I'm talking very yeah. little. Um, most of our projects are, you know, no money down from our perspective. Right. Um, we might have to outlay soft costs in terms of legal fees and surveys and some architectural fees and reports and this sort of stuff. But typically, when we get an investor on board, those fees are paid back and it all becomes part of that development mm. deal. Um, so that's certainly something it opened my eyes to, you know, um, working with investment partners that are cash rich and time yeah. poor. Um, we are time rich and experience rich, but cash yeah. poor. So that's a, a very good combination. You know, we basically bring investment partners on board to purchase the asset. Um, Sometimes it's on an equity split. So we bring the deal, we bring the expertise, we bring the delivery, they bring the money and it's a 50, 50 joint yeah. venture. Um, and that's, that's the split. Um, there's all sorts of variations in between that. Um, and that's the beauty of negotiation and beauty of structuring things that hopefully work for both parties. Fantastic. And how do you go about meeting these sorts of investors? Good question. Um, Networking. I mean, very early on, I was out a lot mm. networking in evenings and weekends, speaking to people, property events, business events, um, social media as well. You know, raising your profile online. We actually crowdfunded one of our first schemes in XP Property that opened our network of potential investors. So we crowd raised £350,000 to convert a basement into two flats. Um, and that really helped with someone else plugging you from a social media perspective, somebody else's news um, email database, you know, having your face on on their um, mm. mail shots. Um, so we kind of early on, I guess, use some things like that to grow our profile in the space. Jack and I both do keynote you know, presentations and speaker sort of um, opportunities at various property networks. We sponsor a couple of property networks with with Aura. So that's helped to bring in some property development clients within Aura as well. Um, so yeah, really kind of any any mode we can to get our faces out there, to get our names out there. Um, word of mouth, internet, social media, with, everything with, we can. This, this concept of using other people's money, as I was saying earlier, for, for a lot of people <clears throat> that might be a really sort of like, huh, what, how, how is that, mm -hmm. how is that going to work or, um, or the, or their, is there more risk, would you say, in using somebody else's money or actually is it, is it mitigate a lot of your risk because you're being very selective with the types of investors that you're working with and they can bring in other expertise and other, you know, ability to market as well? Or um, yeah, I, it, it's a difficult one. There's, there's a lot of risk in property mm. and I, I think you, know, you have to understand that there is absolutely a lot of risk and, you know, I am personally guaranteed up to my eyeballs to the tune of, you know, millions of pounds that I don't necessarily yeah. have. Um, all of the developments that we work on are property asset backed um, investments. So, so actually, 
the value of those assets far outweighs the debt on mm. them. But that's still not to say that I don't have these personal guarantees and, and I'm holding some of that risk. So um, there's risk for the investment partner. There's risk for us. There's risk all around. Part of being a good developer is understanding that right. risk, is quantifying it, is understanding um, where you can add value, where you need to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and and fundamentally being open and honest with your, your investment partners. That's one thing I think Jack and I have I've built a very good reputation for because genuine, genuinely that's that's who we are as people like we do we are trustworthy and we do like to you know um create win-win scenarios and not let people down um but anyone investing in property should understand that there is a high level of risk i think people watch homes under the hammer and think mm -hmm. it's easy you know you buy a property you, you tart it up and you sell it on and you make a profit um it's really not that easy and the figures that they put on homes under the hammer just make me laugh because they don't include stamp duty they don't include transactional costs often don't include professional fees all of the other stuff that you kind of don't yeah. see um eats into that profit margin um and i think if anyone's looking to get into property development, I think you need to have a longer term view mm. on it. I think some people see it too much as a make money quick type process. And it really isn't. We're in this four years now. Um, and I can tell you it's a hard slog. Right. Our, our biggest issue in our property development business is cash flow because it's lumpy cash. You know, you might go three years without seeing a penny back on a development. Um, and that, you know, that, that might be a couple of hundred thousand pounds when mm -hmm. it comes in. But you've still got to cash flow the business yeah. and operate it like a business um, until that. So time. is this where Aura then really kind of comes into play as a <laughs> as a fast cash flowing business? I mean, this is this is kind of a nice model, if you like, is as an entrepreneur to set up number one, set up a service, professional services industry business, get it cash flowing, get you know protect your profit margins, automate it to, to as much as you possibly can, and you've got money coming in. Then with the profits of that, then you start investing into slower, slower turnover types of, mm -hmm. of, of, um, of assets and then cash in after four or five years or, or however, <laughs> whatever your, your, your investment strategy is. The goals are. Yeah, it, it is. I think, you know, Aura has been great for that just keeping that that sort of cash flow mm -hmm. coming in um i mean that's not to say that isn't easy. sure you know that isn't hard either because it, it, it really is um and i feel like i'm only really where i want the business to be around about now and that's five mm -hmm. years in it's been you know it's been a hard slog to get to this point um and i think the the cash that that business can generate can easily be swallowed up if you are continuing to grow. So we have grown significantly in the last five years. You know, we're a team of 13 yeah. now. Um, and, you know, this this year, we probably will turn over close to a million pounds. And that takes work. It takes a big team. And you need to have your kind of strategy in place to kind of get there. Yeah, so we've, we have grown significantly. That growth takes you know, takes away some of that profit because you're reinvesting into the business to grow it more. I'm only really at the point now since February when we moved into our new offices where I've tried to consolidate and I've, I've actively now switched from sort of growth mode to consolidation and profit yeah. mode. You know, for me now, it's all about net margin. It's all about the bottom line, stripping out costs where possible, you know, trying to um, um, increase that, that revenue and improve gross profit margin, which is effectively the efficiency of the team. Um, so that's the kind of mindset I'm now in. And it's great to have that business kind of running alongside the bigger pools of, of, of funds that a, like you say, slow pound, slow moving um, business like a property development business mm. is. And that's why XP surveys is going to help to bolster some of the XP property, um, you know, lumpy fees because that's a service-based business which is a cash so flow is xp business. surveys then more associated with xp property rather than aura yeah so so it's probably worth describing the ecosystem right. that we've got going on because actually aura architecture is 100 percent my ownership xp property and xp surveys is myself and jack 50 50. jack has a um a HMO and property management business called Central Suites. Um, that's him and his brother. Mm -hmm. um, we are within XP Property, actually a 25% shareholder in a housing association um, property development venture. 
um, which is very exciting. That's been going on for 18 months. That's another business actually that I haven't really touched on. Um, but that's pretty much grown a 16 million pound portfolio in the last 18 yep. months, which is insane. Um, and that's, you know, a bit of, bit of social good, um, you know, housing supported living, um, type tenants. Um, but yeah, is, is kind of a, a minor part of XP property. Um, so there's, there is a big ecosystem. We've kind of taken things with the surveys from kind of start through the design process with Aura, through the development process with XP property, and then on to really kind of the letting side of it with, with Jack's Central Suites Limited um, business. So there is a, a real kind of start to finish ecosystem in play here um and that has you got been a contracting company part, part of the grand strategy we don't have a country a contracting company and um to be honest i never <laughs> want one <laughs> i'd imagine it's an absolute nightmare um at this point we just tender out right. and um you know we have a select few that we work with but um if, if i could bring on board someone with the skill set and experience that has built one in mm -hmm. the past that's the only way i would even consider yeah. doing it because I could not deal with that stress. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So there's, so there's quite a, an ecosystem here, of both your of your businesses and Jack's businesses, kind of nicely intersecting with each other and supporting each other. Um, XP surveys, surveys is, is assisting with cash flow for the you know both Aura and XP surveys are assisting with cash flow wise <laughs> into XP property, um, and uh, you know you're, you're also using external investors as well in terms of using mm -hmm. external investors and one one thing you know a lot of architects are keen on for example one of the main drivers for um, wanting to do your own development is creative control so, so what does it mm -hmm. look like in terms of you know what you want to design and the kind of creative impetus behind a, a personal uh, well, an, an XP property development project, or is it really the numbers come first and then the design follows, or is it a mix of two? Or what? What are the sorts of requirements that you need to satisfy your investors? Yeah, there, there is definitely a mix of understanding and wanting to be creative, but also understanding the commercial side of things. Yeah, and I would, I, I do really try to instill this in in my you know, architectural team that I want every one of them to work on a property development project mm. um, closely with me to understand that every single line you draw on that drawing board is costing me money <laughs> and to have a commercial mindset and understanding of how things work in operation in real life will make them better architects will make them better designers mm. that's not to say you need to strip out the creativity because you can still have that but where there is a an efficiency to be had or a better layout or a better arrangement or a better use of that space by the buyer or the occupier um you know i want them to explore that and i think that can often get overlooked without having a true understanding of the commercial side of things very good but yeah in, ter in terms of the uh the 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 control that I like to have on the design, I am pretty anal from that perspective. I think when we do employ external architects, because we do, we don't always use Aura for our projects. Right. Um, they probably think, who is this guy? Why is he coming back with these red pen scribbles and telling me how to do my job? And um, But ultimately, I, I do feel like every transformation from where they got to to where I've got to is a better solution is a better way of laying out that apartment mm. is a better way of thinking about how the user is going to use it um and from a financial perspective it's costing me less so that that's very interesting so you don't always use aura as the architectural designers no it's, a, it's <clears throat> i think it's actually a very very sort of good thing to talk about because i found it really difficult having both of those entities yeah um maybe mainly because I own 100% of Aura. Yes. So, you know, I have a um, responsibility to create a profitable business, a sustainable business mm -hmm. within Aura itself, mm -hmm. which means I can't do on the cheap for XP property. Yeah. If that makes sense. So, that is a bit of a battle that I've had today. And certainly in the early days of XP property, I was physically doing a lot of the drawing work myself. You know, I was on sure. AutoCAD. You know, I kind of I enjoyed it. I kind of do miss doing that sometimes. Um, but because we're a startup, because we're a small business, 
like part of my role within the business was to bring that design side of things. Um, but even now I find myself weighing up resource within Aura, profit within Aura and speed and cost to XP property. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I do, I do find it very difficult to kind of balance that between the two. Has it, has it meant that as inside of Aura, you've been able to actually create a much more, um, appealing or compelling offer to your developer clients? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do think that as in, as an architectural practice, when working with property developers, we are miles ahead of the best. I, mm -hmm. I, I do think because of the commercial sense of, um, that developer mindset that I do instill within the team, they're constantly thinking about the commercial elements of the design and not just how good it looks. Yep. And you know, we, we kind of, the, the tagline that I use is architecture for developers by developers, because that's what I want us to be known for. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at the, at the head of the business is myself. A lot of the team have worked for, are, um, have worked for developers, you know, have done investments and refurbishments alongside, um, their main work. So understand that, like I say, every line that they draw is costing someone money. Um, and they need to be conscious of that. Is there any conflict of interest with say, for example, you being on the development side and being the head of aura with say other developer clients where they might feel a little bit like, Oh, hold on a minute. This guy's actually with this hat on, he's serving us with the other hat. He's a competition. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very <laughs> good point. And I have had, um, yeah, one particular development and developer in uh, in particular, whereby I don't know, I feel like it went a bit sour because of my involvement in the property industry, as opposed to just an architectural practice. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like we certainly added a significant amount of value because of you know the commercial mindset and and vision of what kind of we have created or what we did create, mm -hmm. um, but the kind of cross marketing of the architectural practice within the property industry, um, I think just left a bad taste and going forward, it's something I'm conscious right. of, but I just don't think it should change the way that we operate yeah. because we are adding significant amount of money to our developer clients. And I know we yeah. are because they keep coming back. Um, well, that, well, that, well, that's it. It's because it's on, on the one hand, you've got this very unique, offering and insight and and intelligence that you're able to package up and offer as a service to a developer um and there might be the off chance that you guys might you know be com be in competition at another in another project obviously mm -hmm. i mean the the other <clears throat> on the flip side of it there are developers that we work with and that have come through you know me via aura mm -hmm that we have helped out financially. You know, we've introduced our investment partners from the property development side of the business to our architectural clients oh, wow. to, you know, bring finance to their packages, to bring opportunities to sell their finished design that we've designed and taken through planning to some of my property contacts, you know, and, and that also has benefits. Yeah. So, yes, there are some drawbacks of competition, but actually there, there really is enough to go around. And I, I think the sort of scarcity mindset from a property development perspective, I just isn't, is not my, yeah. my mentality at all. And I don't think it's the right mentality to have because there are projects out there. Um, you know, we're doing joint ventures with other developers. We're doing joint ventures with landowners. Um, all of those opportunities come about because I've got my fingers in those different pies, mm -hmm. you know, in the architectural space, in the property space, in the surveying space. Um, interestingly, we, we bid on something, um, in Wandsworth with XP property missed out just, and the very next day we had an inquiry through the measured survey business for that site <laughs> from the developer that won the bid. So I now know who owns that site and I could open the conversation to, uh, see what they're doing on it. Very, I love it. I love it. Covering a few bases. Yeah, re really, really fascinating. Has the, has kind of starting up your own capital company or investment company been 
you know something you've thought about so actually as a as an architecture firm you're now approaching developers you've got architectural services and then you've got well potential invest investment which you guys use for your own property developments but also you know it's actually as a packaged offer for developer clients yeah as i said my wife won't let me set okay. up another one so <laughs> <laughs> no there's i'm sure in the future there'll be there'll be all sorts of um things that we can do you know we we have built this ecosystem to allow um those opportunities to come to us yep. um and the more we get ourselves out there the bigger the company grows the more reach we have um you know i do honestly believe that opportunities will arise out of that and that's part of why i wanted to understand marketing understand you know reaching the most amount of people as we can mm. um, and i've still got a long way to go on that like i've i I've actually left the marketing from an aura perspective almost a year, I would say, just kind of doing its own thing. Um, I'm in the process of trying to recruit a marketing manager, so it's not reliant on me anymore mm -hmm. um, because there's so much more I want to do. We've just started our um, Homes Under the Camera YouTube series. Um, so we've got we've launched three videos, I think, so far of some of our projects, which um, yeah, take take a look. We've got another one coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I've taken on a videographer to kind of help um, build that presence because one, YouTube is owned by Google. Mm -hmm. It's the second biggest search engine in the world. Yep. Um, so any video that goes up on there is going to help your, your web page, help your traffic, help your SEO, organic reach. Um, and video is, is the future. You know, we've seen that progress in the last couple of years from, you know, images to, to videos, to TikToks, to reels, to shorts, all of that good stuff that I haven't scratched the surface of, um, but really want to, um, just haven't found the time. You know, it's, there's a lot going on um, and I need some extra help. Love it. Ben, thank you very much. That's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Absolute Yourself. brilliant masterclass there and deep dive into you know the, all the different design entrepreneurial ventures that you're that you're involved in and i think a lot of architects and a lot of our listeners are going to find an enormous amount of value from from uh, hearing your expertise and your story so thank you very much pleasure and no, i've really enjoyed it actually it's been uh been good to discuss the various things that are going on and sometimes it's hard to kind of um appreciate or pat yourself on the back and take stock and i think definitely um, these sorts of things help you do that so thank you very much Pleasure. brilliant and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.